Well, I missed you all. Did you miss me? I missed you. I missed my family. I missed my church family. Uh, but I will say, I enjoyed the two weeks off. I hope, did you enjoy Chris Wallace? He has moved over to Decatur, so we'll try to get him more often. He just lives on the other side of Atlanta, so I'll try to reel him in. He's a blessing to me, and I knew he would be to you. So I thank him for filling in while Robert and I were gone. We had a great time. We were at Disney World. Do you all know something about Disney? There's nobody there mad. I don't know how they pulled it off. Nobody's mad. I believe the kingdom of God's a little better than Walt's kingdom. Do you? So I believe we can pull this off with a bunch of happy folks that love the Lord. While I was gone for two weeks, I prayed about where we should go for the holidays, for Christmas. And I landed on something called Influencer or Redeemer. And I want to talk to you the next six weeks, all the way to the end of the year, just about Jesus. And I want to give you my take on it and what I've come to learn about him, walking with him my whole life. And when I say that, at age five, I remember praying a prayer at age five at Revival Tabernacle on South 11th Street in Gaston, Alabama. And I, uh, if, if, you know, I don't even know if this is theologically right or not, but at five years old, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I don't know what that meant at five years old, but I do remember walking up and kneeling and praying a prayer at five years old. But I've grown up in church. I've grown up in a Christian family. I've grown up in a family that loves the Bible and that raised me as a son to love the Bible. And so at 58 years old, I've had a lot of years to work out this person called Jesus. This Middle Eastern man with a beard that claimed he was God, that said he's the only way to God. And I've had to work that out because there's a lot of other religions that say they go to God too. And if you follow Oprah, she says everybody can take you to God. And so, but Christians say, no, there's only one way, which does seem slightly unfair that we've got the only way to get into heaven, which is Jesus. That does seem a little bit uh, arrogant that we say he's the only way. But I want to take you over the next six weeks. So if you can't come back, which I understand sometimes schedules don't permit you to be here every week, I would highly encourage you to try to be here every week. But if you can't, we post the videos usually every Tuesday. Thanks to Ryan back in the back. Everybody give Ryan a hand clap for doing that. Thank you. He edits it down and makes me look smart and shares it out there with everybody. But I want to take you on a journey and I want to give you six things about Jesus Christ, one a week, that I pray will up your understanding of him so that he's more than just a Christmas story or more than just a you know, a name that you say, if I say his name, I can get into heaven. And if I say Jesus is Lord, I can live for eternity in heaven. I want to take you on a journey to open up and expand who he is to us and then give you the opportunity each week to deepen your relationship with him. I titled it Influencer or Redeemer, meaning that a lot of Christians today, especially in America, you know, we understand this term, an influencer. It's somebody that has pull. It's somebody that can market their product well and can influence you to make decisions. And whether that's selling a product or, you know, influencers for Disney World. They're, the amount of people that follow them can determine whether or not I can cause you to buy my product and buy in. And we, you know, probably 10 years ago would have never considered this, but due to social media... Uh, it's a thing now. You can get rich being an influencer. It, just having people follow you and getting likes and having people like the product that you sell. Now that translates to Jesus to ask the question, was he an influencer of his time? Without having social media and Instagram, I think we could say in some ways he was. He got masses of people to show up. He got masses of people to follow him. But there's about three places that make me think that Jesus wasn't here to influence anybody. He came to redeem people. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't care about influencing you, 
But the three places I landed on to say that Jesus perhaps wasn't an influencer, but he was a redeemer. Now, an influencer cares about your opinions. An influencer cares about likes and dislikes. An influencer cares about how many people watches their stories. But as we read about Jesus, who is this great, kind, wonderful, good God, he has this side to him that he really doesn't care about your opinion. And he doesn't even care if it hurts your feelings. He even calls one woman and refers to her as a dog and doesn't even apologize. That would tell me he's either a really bad influencer <laughs> because you have to care about people's opinions. And the thing about that is we live in a generation where everybody's opinion is now their God. And opinions have become God. Your feelings have become God. And so Jesus, the way I know he wasn't an influencer, is that he said this to a woman and a husband after he healed their child. He said, listen, don't tell anybody what I just did. And, and that's not very demeaning because what he just did was raise the kid from the dead. Now an influencer would have posted it and said, go tell everybody what I just did. So it tells me that there's something different about Jesus that he really wasn't on an ego trip to try to get himself known. He came for something totally different. And then if we read John chapter 6, we find out he wasn't an influencer because that's one of my favorite passages where he says, well, if you want to follow me, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody on the hillside leaves him. And then he turns to 12 that he was influencing and said, do you guys want to go too? Because I really don't care. There's the door. Well, you don't do that if you're an influencer. Because he had something greater than influence. He had a purpose to redeem people. And he wasn't going to let anything stand in that way. And one way I definitely know he wasn't an influencer is by the time his ministry was done, he had 120 followers that were bought in. If you had 120 followers on social media today, you would be broke. People would laugh at a young generation. You only have 120 followers. My daughter, Victoria Kate, has something called Vicky Loves Mickey. Uh, and she just has this whole Instagram thing where she just does Disney World stuff. She's already got nearly 2,000 followers. Just people that want to know Disney World. The son of the living God, Jesus Christ, could only amass 120 followers. He would be a joke today. And he came from the wrong side of the tracks. He came from redneck Galilee. He came from Nazareth, and even people's comment was, can anything good come from Nazareth? That'd be like saying temple. Can anything good come from temple? <laughs> but over the next six weeks, I want to take you on my journey of that he's a redeemer. He doesn't care about your feelings. He doesn't care about your opinions. He cares about your soul. And he wants to redeem your soul. And so that's my goal over the next six weeks. I want to share some scriptures with you to kind of show you what I mean of where I want to take you. Isaiah 9, verse 6. 700 years before Jesus arrives on the scene, a prophet named Isaiah prophesies about him and says this. It's a very Christmassy passage. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now to let you know it's more than a Christmas story or some virgin girl that has a baby or some manger, the next phrase out of his mouth is, and the government, meaning this is huge. The government will be up on his shoulders, meaning this is not something that's just going to be a season or a month out of the year. This is not just going to be a time where we give presents and, and make Christmas ornaments together and tell stories and sing Silent Night. He doesn't even lend to a thing called Christmas. The next thing after the semicolon is and the government, meaning it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be something that has to do with authority, something that has to do with power, something that has to do with a life change on planet Earth. But yet, this unto us a child is born is what we call Christmas. 
Unto us a son is given. It's what we call Bethlehem. And it happens in one day in the month of December. And if you really study it out, he probably wasn't even born in December, but, but we celebrate it there. But I present to you that for unto us a child is born and a son is given are, are the Christians that see him as an influencer. We, we wear the shirts, we, we put the tinsel over the door, and we, we read the story out of Luke 2. But I will say this, you cannot be an influencer and keep going because it says, and the government. Because the moment you serve Jesus Christ, he is going to get all up in your business. And he's going to let you know, I'm in charge and not you. I'm the one that calls the shots and not you. You're here for me. I'm not here for you. You do my purposes. I don't do your purposes. And this is why a lot of Christians get ticked off. Because they they don't want to go past the semicolon and they just want to keep him into an influencer where he answers all my prayers, fixes all my problems, helps all my needs, gives me a job, gives me money. He influences me. And as long as he does, I give him hearts and likes. Oh, I love him. He's so good to me. But the moment he doesn't do what I want him to, I lose faith. I become agnostic, atheist, bitter, ticked off. How could God let me? How could God let me get sick? How could God let this happen to me? Because when he's, when he's just an influencer, you get mad if he doesn't impress you. But if you say, and his government, you have to understand there's a higher power than just how you feel. There's an authority beyond just what you're going through. And then it says, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. In what we call Christmas, there's this thought that that it's just bigger than a story. It's just bigger than a name, Jesus. Every bit of this has to do with government. It's why I believe so many Christians can live anemic, weak lives. You have a prayer card on your seat. It says, what do you want God to do for you? Several weeks ago, we filled those out and we brought them to the communion tables. There were hundreds of them over the two services. And we took them and we gave them to our intercessors downstairs and they put them all on a table and they began to pray over all of those prayer cards. And then Pastor Phil took those prayer cards and went through every one of them and just kind of put the statistics together and then shared those with me. And he said nearly 90%, 85% of every prayer was either for sickness and healing or money. And it made me wonder, what do we really believe about God? That 80% of the room would say, I'm either sick or I'm in need of money. I'm going to teach on that soon. But but it does make me realize that it's easy to believe that he's the great healer or magician or the wizard of the eternal world. He's Jesus, the Son of God. But when we come to the government, what if Jesus said back to me, Well, the reason you're sick, Mark, is you don't take care of yourself. Don't blame your sickness on me, Mark. You keep asking me to heal you, but I want to go deeper than just healing you. I want to change the habits that are creating chaos in your life. Well, God, I as semicolon, I just want you to give me money. I need money. I need finances. And he goes, good. I'm glad you always come to me like a banker. But I want to go past the semicolon into government and say that I would rather deal with your selfish behavior that spends more money than you make. Rather than just me writing you checks all the time. So we do know that this passage is, is laden with... Uh, How shall I say? It's calling us deeper. It's calling us to really ask, what do we believe? I'm not asking you to do believe a child is born and a son is given. I'm asking you, do you believe the government is his? Is he in charge of your life? Does he call the shots? Does he determine how you feel rather than you determining how you feel? Because that's what the Redeemer came to do. He came to bring a government into our life. Goes on. 
Once the son is born and he comes a man, his name is Jesus. He's known around town as a prophet. He's known around town as maybe Elijah has come back. They don't really know. They're trying to figure it out. They, you know, some say he's the devil. So everybody's kind of got their hand on him because he, ha- he does have such influence. And it kind of makes the religious people nervous because he's garnering a lot of followers that makes the religious crowd a little nervous because they're not getting all those followers. And so Jesus says to this little motley crew that he has following him, he says, well, let's really talk. And this is interesting. Because he says, I need to know who you say that I am. Now that's strange because he could have just looked at Juwan and said, Juwan, I don't really care what you think. I already know what I think. Leslie, I already know who I am. I don't need your opinion of me. So when he asked, who do you say that I am to his followers, it was not that Jesus needed affirmation. He knew who he was. But what he wanted to show us is that what you think about him can revolutionize your life. And that you could follow him but have the wrong thoughts about him and to be a follower with the wrong thoughts can have catastrophic results. It's how 80% of the people who follow him could be sick or 80% of the people be broke. Because when I follow him as a believer, but I don't really know who he is, I'm following him, but with very little results. And then therefore other people say, well, I don't know why I would serve God. Nothing's different about you than me. We're the same. Your marriage is broken and so is mine. Your health is bad and so is mine. So Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am? To bid them, I need to... What? How would I put this? I need to center up. I, I need to plumb line what you think about me. Because it matters. And so Peter, if you know the story, Matthew 16, answers verse 17. And he said, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus said back to Peter, blessed are you, Simon. Watch what happens when you get the answer right. A blessing follows it. If you want to live a blessed life, you need to think right about who Jesus is. Who do you say I am? You're the son of the living God. That's right. So you're blessed because you got it right. So what it tells me about Jesus, there could be a lot of people who know him but don't know him. Who follow him but don't know him. And so then their lives aren't blessed. Their their, their lives are chaos. Ask yourself right now, are you a Christian that lives in perpetual chaos? If so, it's probably not the devil's fault. If you're a follower of Jesus whose life and marriage and health and money is in a state of perpetual chaos, it probably has more to do with what you know about Jesus and whether or not you're under his government or you're under his influence. Because you can be under his influence and a chaotic mess. But you can't be under his government and a chaotic mess. Because when you're under his government and you know who he is, he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, verse 18, you're Peter. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. Now he takes me deeper that there is something going on beyond just what you see. There is a world that is in war in the unseen realm. And now Jesus says, here's what, ooh, this is crazy. He said, when you know who I am, you not only are blessed in the seen world, but you have authority and power in the unseen realm. That means there's a lot of Christians who follow him as an influencer, but they have no authority. Their prayers are very weak. Nothing changes in their life. They live stressed out all the time because they don't understand that if you know him and you really know who he is, there's a blessing that comes on your life. And that blessing says that when you know who I am, no power of hell can overcome you. 
And there's a lot of people worried today. Oh my God, the world's going to hell in a handbag. Do you think the rapture's quick? I mean, look at Israel, look at Palestine. Do you think we're at the end? And I say, honey, I don't know when the end is, but if you know him, you have nothing to worry about. Well, do you think he's going to come get us? Well, if he does, glory to God. But if he doesn't, you have every right and every authority over every spirit of hell. He's given you that authority. He goes on to say, and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you had the keys to the kingdom of heaven, does that sound like a weak little Christian to you? Poor pitiful me. Nothing ever goes my way. I call it the Eeyore spirit. Oh, oh, nothing ever goes my way. Every, this is just my opinion. So you, you write this note. This is only his opinion. I think whiny, complaining, griping, critical Christians do not know the Jesus they need to know. Because they walk around like they're imprisoned by life and feelings and emotions rather than I have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. No weapon formed against me will prosper. How can you say that so arrogant? Because I know him. Well, you think he, he has some special thing about you? Oh, no, 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 I'm not special. He's special and I know him. He owes me nothing, but he gives me everything. How can you say that? Because I know him. You see, there's a fine line between I know him and being arrogant. There's a fine line between I know him and just putting your foot down and holding your shoulders back and throwing your arms in the air and letting every demon of hell know you are off limits and he cannot have you because you belong to Jesus Christ. Whatever you bind on earth, We'll be bound in heaven, he said. This is Jesus saying this stuff. This isn't some psychiatrist. Whatever you bind on earth, Tony, I'll bind it in heaven. Does that sound like a weak, anemic Christianity to you? Jesus gives you authority. In other words, there's to be, when you know him, there's to be this connection to the heavenly realm. He ever intercedes for me. I hear his voice. I wake up in the morning and go, what do you want out of me today, Jesus? What do you want for me to do? Because he's not a mute idol. He talks. And then when he talks to me, I walk into his government. This is just the intro. It's pretty good. I've missed preaching for two weeks. Can you tell? I'm hyped up on a Mickey cookie. Paul will say this. Philippians chapter 3, he said, I just want to know him. I don't think he's thinking, I want to know the influencer. I think he's thinking, I want to know the redeemer because he said, I want to know the power. I want to know the fellowship. And I'll tell you this about Paul. I think he knew the redeemer because when they chunked him in the middle of a hole in the ground and left him there for years, he didn't whine and holler. He goes on to write in Philippians, I just learned to rejoice at whatever I do. I rejoice in the Lord. And let me say it again, rejoice in the Lord, oh my soul. And let me say it again, I've learned to be content in whatever situation. That's not somebody that's an influencer follower. That's somebody that knows the redeemer. They stoned him and left him for dead. You know what he did? He didn't get up and go, I don't know why they stoned me. I thought I was serving him. He got up, dusted himself off, and went right back in the same town and said, Yo, I'm back. Because he knew the Redeemer. My opinion is the reason so many young people are deconstructing from church is they met the influencer Jesus instead of the Redeemer. They've got the little personal Jesus that fits in their little wife's little phone and follows them around and blesses them to hit all the green lights so that they're not late for work. But they've never met the Redeemer. The one that even when all hell fall, falls out, you're like, no, man, I'm not, I'm not quitting. I'm not tapping out. Yeah, but he should have, and if he loved you, nope, nope, I'm not tapping out. I know him. I'm not quitting. I know him. Well, you've been stabbed in the back. I don't care. I'm in for him. Well, it didn't go your way. Your wife this, your husband that. I don't care. What would happen if 
the followers left the influence Jesus and started following the Redeemer. You couldn't shut us up. You literally could not shut us up. I think we could change the world. So here's what I want to do. That's the intro. But I wanted to, I wanted to spend extra time on it because I wanted you to see that when you know Him, there's supernatural results. When you know Him beyond the influence of Christmas and you know Him intimately, power comes to you. Authority comes to you. Your kids go off in rebellion and you're like, nope, nope, I call them right back home. Why? Because I have authority. No weapon can come. So here's what I want to do. If you ever need somebody to do graphics, you're welcome, that's me. Only took me nine years. I put a graphic on the screen that represents time from the left. It's, it's before time and then, quote, evolution, the Big Bang. Christians would say that this is God saying, let there be light. And then the world, and then the end of the world, and then we step into what we'll call eternity. So on that little screen is the beginning to the end of time. Now what I would like to do over the next six weeks is I would like to teach you about this character called Jesus over the span of the course of history so that I don't just dumb him down to Christmas but I look at him across the scope of eternity. And when I know him from an eternal time frame... I, under, I can understand him better. So what I'm going to attempt to do, I hope I do it well, I'm going to attempt to define Jesus based on time. This, I don't want to go too deep on Sunday, but for those of you that understand theoretical thinking, time is another dimension. It's, it's not just noon till when are we going to get out of here. It's a dimension. Some people believe you can bend it. Some people believe you can time travel. Some people believe Elon Musk came back from wherever. But it's not just something that I'm up here saying is thoughtful. I mean, time is a dimension. People are trying to understand how it works. Do we just repeat ourselves? I was watching a scientist say that what they're trying to do, and this is not Christian, but they're trying to bend time to the point that they can create a loophole and, and you kind of can just pass through dimensions. Uh, watch Interstellar. It's a good movie that kind of talks about that. But Jesus Christ, how many of you know, He is the beginning and He is the end. He is the Alpha and He is the Omega. And when he created this thing, strange though it may be, time that we call time on our watch or seasons of the year or decades or centuries or millennia, how we, how we negate time with calendars and appointments, I want you to understand there's something divine about the issue called time. It's divine. How do I know it's divine? Because God put us into it and bound us to time. It doesn't matter what we do, we're bound to it. Here's the weird thing. You did not even get a choice of when you hopped in. Your folks hooked up. You popped out. Welcome to time. It's called your birthday. Sometimes time is fair and you get to live a long time. And when you die, we go, how old were they? Well, they were 92. Woo, they had a good life. But if you die young, we say, well, they got ripped off. Because the only way we understand God is in time. So when I pray a prayer, I need healing, I'm automatically waiting on a time for God to heal me. So if I'm not careful, I will judge God based on time of whether he did it and how quickly he did it or did he even do it at all. For I prayed for my mother to get healed. She didn't get healed. She died anyway. Therefore, God's not a healer. Because when I prayed for my mother to get healed here, 
but she died here. She died before she got healed. I judge God, not a healer. Why? Because a human will always judge God within the scope of time. But when my mother dies and enters into the eternal realm, is she healed or not healed? She's healed. So she got a healing. She just didn't get a healing within the scope of time. And then therefore, I I deduce that God's not a healer and I, I get mad at him. Because that's the only way I can know him is based on time. In the morning, it's mercy. And when you go to bed, don't go to bed angry. That's how we live it. You're given a certain amount of it, don't blow it. So what I would like to do is take this divine thing, and here's what's strange. (laughs) No matter how spiritual you get, you don't get any more. Everybody in the room for the raunchiest of the raunch to the greatest of the holy, you all get 24 hours. The more spiritual don't get any more. So know this, uh, this is not my teaching, but it is thought-provoking. Know this, if you want to know how the devil can destroy a Christian, stop thinking about sin and start thinking about how you utilize time. We're we're thinking sinful behaviors, that is bad, but, but there's many people alive that are living on a time frame, but they're doing nothing for God. So somebody who's in time doing nothing, you're of no value to the kingdom. You've been given an amount of time to spread it. So what I want to do is I want to take the beginning of time to what we would call eternity. And I would like to define Jesus Christ in that because I believe God set it up to where I could define him through time. Now the issue becomes, this is my thinking... The issue becomes when I'm born here, so toward the end of time, we're we're probably a little closer, maybe about right there, (laughs) depending on what news you watch, (laughs) but you're about right here. Well, when you come in right here and the only Jesus you know is here, Christmas Jesus, Easter Jesus. And you miss this Jesus that's been all the way here, I could safely say it's probably going to be a very anemic Christianity for you. So, but if you know him over time, it becomes intimately deep, full of power and authority. So let's go to here's where it gets very interesting, and I'm going to do it pretty quickly, but I'm going to take you somewhere. I want to back up. Before time. Now to understand, do you believe that Jesus existed before there was even time? Yes. His name wasn't Jesus before time. His name was the Word of God. But the person who will become Jesus, the Word becomes flesh. The Word here becomes flesh here. But it's the same being. So if I only know Christmas Jesus in the flesh, I'm going to miss the word that's here. But if I only know Christmas Jesus here and miss the word that became flesh here and then miss the Jesus of the flesh that is now called King of Kings and Lord of Lords and his name is now called the word of God here. Do you see how I view this exponentially expounds my thinking on him? So now we'll talk about it next week, so I won't belabor that. I was about to go somewhere, but I'll hold that till next week. Now, to talk about the Jesus, quote, the Jesus that was in the flesh before time, we're going to go to the book of Revelation, and we're going to go to Revelation 13, which is a hot topic right now, because Revelation 13 talks about the Antichrist that will be taking over the world. And that if you don't, worship him you cannot buy or sell and then you get the marks and the chips and all the stuff and AI and everything we talk about now so to understand the Jesus before time we're going to go to the last book of our Bible at the end of time to try to figure it out Revelation let me run through them let me just tell you where I'm going to go and then we'll know we've got before we're going to look at creation the Old Testament the birth the purpose and then the church. We're going to look at all of those over the next six weeks. 
Revelation 13. The beast... How many of you sounds like we're going to have a hard row on this one? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise authority for 42 months. And the beast opened its mouth, verse 6 of Revelation 13, to blaspheme God. So there's going to be a spirit over our earth that will blaspheme God and slander His name. They're already doing that now. If you even claim Jesus Christ, you're, you're the lowest of the low. And, and they did His dwelling place. Some think that's the church. Some think that's heaven and those who live in heaven. And the beast was given power to wage war. Again, I want you to understand, this is not just a Christmas story. There's a war going on. And what you know about Jesus determines how you fare in this war. And there was given power to the beast to wage war against God's holy people. How many of you, don't you need a science degree for this one, believe there's a war on God's people today? Yeah, I mean, there's a war on every religion in some sense, but there is a war against Christianity today, especially in our culture. And it tries to conquer them. It actually says it does conquer them. And it was given authority. There's the word authority. Does this look like government here? There's a war between governments. There's a beast with power that's at war against the people to conquer them. That's government. And he takes authority. And just now, this is for all of us apocalyptic people who like generators and cows and land. You're very naive to think if you get cows in a generator, you can overcome this thing because this spirit touches every tribe, people, language, and nation. And if you think running off into Wyoming in the mountains will get you away and you can live on a little nice hunk of land and, and get away with it, you're mistaken. Because at the end, everything from the water to the animals, everything becomes affected. The deer you kill will have a disease. The water you drink will be ruined. So we kind of are in a thought, but it gets better. All inhabitants of the earth. How many is that? All of them will worship the beast. So there's a power going on. And all whose names, get ready, this is, this is the kicker. And all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. You ready? It's the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Let that sink in a minute. For all these people that say, why would God make humans only to have us riddled with diseases? I listened to an atheist a few weeks ago. His debate was, why would I serve a God that allows babies to die and rapes to happen and wars? Why would I want to serve that God? You see, he had a very naive understanding of God. That God did all this to us. Put us on this God-forsaken thing called planet Earth and just screwed us all over and gives us diseases and lets babies be molested. And Why would I want to serve Him? Well, that's true. I wouldn't want to serve that God, but it's because there's a misunderstanding because they don't know the lamb that was slain before there was ever a problem. So listen carefully. I want to close with this thought. Before there was ever a sin, there was a plan. Before there was ever a devil or a tree or a garden, or an Adam or an Eve, God had a plan in place. So anytime you think, why did He put me on this God-forsaken planet for these God-forsaken things to happen, you've forgotten that there was a plan long before you got here, and His plan was not to screw you over. His plan was that there would be a lamb that would be slain before the creation of the world ever came into existence. And when you judge God based on you, you get screwed up thinking of God. But when you judge God based on the lamb that was there that was to come, everything makes sense. There was a lamb that was going to be slain before there was ever a problem. So what do we have to have? We have to have a place for the lamb to go. So earth is created. Well, to be a lamb and to kind of get that... You, you have to have animals. So there were animals, and those animals have to have blood because the lamb is going to be slain. So this is why that there's, there's trees, but there has to be trees made before the lamb's made because the lamb is actually going to be hung on a tree to be cursed. So God's already thought through the whole thing before you ever got here. This is why the Christmas story says he was born in a manger 
which was in the middle of Bethlehem while the shepherds are keeping their what? Their flocks. The whole story just comes all the way to Bethlehem where the lamb is going to be slain. As you go through the Old Testament and you see the killing of all the animals, it's nothing more than an outworking of the lamb that's going to come, kind of, and I'll teach this next week, just opening the way. But what I want you to focus on today is before there was ever a problem, there was this. An innocent, not guilty, sinless person that will be called the Lamb of God. You'll see it through the Old Testament when they have to put the Lamb's blood over the doorpost. All the unfairness of the animals that die so that people can try to live holy with God. But this lamb and this thought was before you ever came into existence. God already had the answer to the problem before there was ever a problem. Why would that tick you off? He gives you the answer to the test before the test ever is written. The problem is, us humans, when he gives us the answer to the test before the test is ever written, we don't trust him. We're sitting there looking at it. And he says, here's the test. There's two trees. There's tree A, tree B. The right answer, tree A. Put A. Gotcha. A is the right answer. Yes, it's a test. Because I'm a loving father, I'm telling you the answer to the test is A. Got it, A. Tree of life, A. Got it. Wife comes along. What, what is this? It's a test. Well, what's the test? Is this A or B? Pick A or pick B. Well, I like B. Well, it's not B, it's A. Well, how do you know it's A? You always think you're right? No, I don't think I'm right. I'm saying he said it was A. The guy that wrote the test, the teacher, that wrote the test said it's A. She said, well, I don't think it's A. I'm going to put B. And then because she was naked, he said, okay. <laughs> Any man would. So she checks the box B. And we're mad at God? For all this hell right now, you're mad at God that told you the answer to the test before there was a test and you chose wrong and you're pissed at Him? Excuse me, that came out a little harsh. <laughs> Ah, Lee. Ah, that was that redneck Georgia coming out. I'm sorry. I apologize. That was rough. But, but that makes you mad? Think this through a minute if you're an atheist or agnostic. You're ticked at the one that told you the answer. You chose the wrong answer. You're mad at him? He's not the problem. He had the answer before you ever showed up. The issue is here, and this is today's lesson, if he had the answer before there was a problem, told you the answer before there was a problem, the issue of Jesus Christ is we really don't trust him. For he says in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. I want to ask you a question. Do you trust him? So what if he doesn't heal you? Do you trust him? If he doesn't give you the job you want, do you trust him? If he doesn't fix your marriage, do you trust him? Because at the core of every deep, meaningful relationship is trust. If you want to ruin a marriage, just lose trust. You can ruin any relationship by losing trust. And at the core of your relationship, do you trust God that had the answer before you ever showed up? He says, trust me. I'm trying to trust you, but my job. I'm trying to trust you, but my husband. I'm trying to trust you, but my money. I'm trying to trust you, but I'm sick. I don't understand where you are when I need you, but do you trust me, Mark? No, but yes. Help my unbelief because I want to trust you. And there's something deep that comes when you just trust him. When you understand, I don't have all the answers, but I trust him. 
I don't know why some get healed and some die, but I trust him. I don't know always who gets into heaven and who doesn't make heaven, but I trust when you get there, I trust his justice makes the right decision because I trust him. I trust him emphatically because you never can walk intimately with him when you're looking over your shoulder waiting on him to mess you up. You must trust him. So the reason he had the answer before the problem ever came, could you not trust that? When he says forgive, but you don't want to forgive, can you trust it? When he says give, but you're broke, can you trust it? When he says love your enemy, but you don't want to, can you trust him? Because this is what it's all about. I'll end with this. Even before, this is Ephesians, Paul picks it up. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ without fault. Tony, before you ever did anything wrong, he already picked you. You see, we think we've got to earn it. No, 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 no. That, that's, the Jesus of, that's the Jesus of the New Testament. The Jesus before time said, before you got here, I loved you and I picked you. Before you did one thing wrong, I already saw you without fault. How could you see me without fault? My whole life has been screwed up. Because you're looking at it within your time frame, Mark, and I'm looking at it within my love. You're looking at your screw-ups being from birth to present day and how much you've messed up. I'm looking at your life based on what I've done through eternity. And he ends this way. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. Come on, somebody. Adopt? Adopt means that your other parents gave you up. You weren't wanted. The devil didn't want you. You were part of his family. God said, I'll take him. I'll adopt him. But he's, he's messed. Sam's messed up. Nope, I want him on my family. Your team? Yep, I want Sam on my team. Well, he was a 17-year meth addict. Why would you want a 17-year meth addict on your team? I don't see a meth addict. I see my son. Well, you should know him. You should know him. Look at all the faults of his life. Look at everything that he's done and all the screw-ups he's had. No, I hold no fault against him. I brought him into my family, and this is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to adopt that old boy there, bring him in so he could know me, and he would be totally forgiven without fault because I forgave him before he was ever born. Close your eyes. Focus your thought. I have a question. I'm going to leave it on the TV as we prepare for communion. But my question today is, why would you not trust him? Before there was a problem, there was the answer. Before there was a crucifixion for sin, before there was an earth, before there was sin on the earth, the answer was there. The lamb was slain before the world was created. God's plan was in place before there was ever a problem. And if you're not careful, you focus on the problem and you lose trust in him. You look at Adam and Eve eating fruit and that creates a problem of incest and molestations and rapes and murders and wars. But if you back up from Adam and go before they messed it up, there was the lamb that was slain before they messed it up. Get your eyes off the problem and get your eyes on the plan. There was a plan before there was a problem. Do not try to justify God off the problem. Justify Him off the promise. There was a lamb slain before there was a problem. That is the promise. And if He did that before there was a problem, trust Him. You're focused on your problem. You're focused on the marriage, the healing, the, the money, the job. Focus on Him and trust Him. Trust Him. And don't trust Him Monday and then give up on Him Tuesday. Don't trust Him Tuesday. That's called wavering. And a double-minded human gets nothing from God when they waver. Why? Because you're judging Him in time. Don't judge Him in time. Judge Him off His eternal nature of the plan in place before you ever messed up. 
Now there's some I just feel in my heart, you need to, you need to buy into this because you're living a guilt-ridden life. You're letting the problem dominate you. You're letting the addiction dominate you. You're letting the habits dominate you. You're letting the unanswered prayers dominate you. You're letting the sickness dominate you. It's thrown you for a loop. You don't even trust Him. So you trust yourself, but not Him. You run after yourself, your stuff, your work. Your, you just work yourself silly. You don't trust Him with your money. You don't trust Him with your marriage. You don't trust Him with your health. You don't trust His government. He told you A, you pick B every time. He told you to give, but you don't. He told you to forgive, but you don't. He told you to seek Him, but you don't. He told you to hunger, but you're not. He said, be thirsty, but you're not. Do you trust His way? Do you trust His plan? Stand up with me, if you will. This is a moment where you have an opportunity to come and settle some things with Him. I'll tell you this of myself, one of the greatest revelations I've ever had has been understanding I was forgiven before I ever got here. It's one of the greatest revelations. I was forgiven before I ever messed up. And oh, does it make it sweet. You're coming today. The way we end is we ask you to come and partake of communion. We have both packaged and bread and juice available. Michael will lead us in some worship as you come. We ask that you be very thoughtful because it's a time of ministry to come, to go back to your chair. Pastor Phil will come and dismiss us. But I'm going to bless it today. If you don't mind, as you come, we do our giving as well. If you're bringing your giving today or you do it online, just put your hands like this. I'm going to bless both. So, Father, I thank you today as we come as followers of you. I pray that what I shared today would be meaningful. I pray that we would ask the question, do we trust you and your government, your plan, even when things seem seemingly go awry? Father, I bless our giving today. I bless our seeds that we sow, our offerings, our tithe. I bless the communion that we partake of. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us now. You capture our hearts before we leave. I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may come and partake of communion. We have tables all over. Come to whatever table's empty. We'll be back in just a minute.